This is a four-part series on making a grinding jig for lathe cutter bits. Notice the tips numbers and the part number and the title here. You are currently watching part one, Introduction and Machining the Master Block. Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your internet shop teacher, and this is part one of a three-part video where I'm going to make the South Bend grinding jig for lathe tools. So I received this one, if you watched the video about a year ago, from a teacher friend of mine by the name of Henry. So go back and watch that video. I'll put the link in the description if I remember. But what this is all about, for those of you that still have small lathes and are using high-speed steel rather than carbides, and I know that this is outmoded, but we're going to go through it anyway. Let me start by explaining what this is. And I have a 1960, no, 1973 South Bend catalog, and this is just their accessories. So I was unable to find this in their thicker catalogs, at least it wasn't in the catalogs that I had. So let me show you what that looks like in the catalog, and then I'll explain a little bit more about this, and then we'll get into some actual machining. All right, here it is in the 1973 catalog. I just showed you the cover. And you cannot buy these anymore. However, there is a company that is making reproductions of this, and I'll give you that link or a little bit more about that later on. But again, the whole purpose of this is for you to hold your tool bit in this fixture that presents it to the grinding wheel at the exact angle, and it makes it much easier for you to grind great tool bits, although it takes a lot longer to use this than doing it freehand. But this is ideal for the beginner or someone that just plain has trouble grinding lathe bits. And here are the instructions that came with this item. Now, I believe I got this from Vintage Machinery, but on this page, and I'll put a still at the end of the video, there's instructions there, and then it, they talk about how to use it on the grinder, and uh, what kind of bit should be held, and, and all of the different things that you might need to know. And there is a parts list of it. For those of you that would like to make this little grinding jig, there are no actual blueprints for it. About a year ago, I had contact with a man out of state that agreed to do the blueprints and something happened, it fell through or he lost interest or something like that. I, I'm not really sure because I've lost contact with him. But at that time, I made a short video, like a 10 minute video that was private and sent to this man so that he would have some dimensions to make the blueprints. So what I'm going to do is make available to you that unlisted video and uh, you can take a look at it. That might help you if you need dimensions or to make some sketches. So here is the title for that and I'll put the uh, link down in the description. Here is the title to that unlisted video. Check it out. Click on the link. Okay, and here it is. This is the one I got from Henry, and he did not know what it was, I don't believe, until he came here to see me. And after we cleaned it up, we found out that there is a South Bend logo on there. I don't know if I got it upside down, but anyway, it says South Bend. This one is used and modified or damaged by students over the years. And those dimensions are on there are left from what I just talked about when I, I made a video for another man. This is a 10 degree angle here. And each one of these came with four different tool holders of different sizes. And the square hole is the difficulty of this whole thing. And that'll be in part two. But there is one of these for quarter inch bits. This is three eighths. 3 sixteenths and 5 sixteenths. Now more than likely you can get by with just making the one for quarter inch bits. 
But I think you can see what this does is that when you clamp your work into the fixture, you can rotate it at different angles, and you've got two different angles here to set it on your tool rest. All right, enough gabbing about that because I'm going to show you how to use it in the last part, which is part three. So the rest of this video will be confined to talking about making this part, the main block. And there's not a whole lot to it other than we've got to bore a hole here, which is, well, I don't know the dimensions. I'll get to that in a minute. And I have to take this block that I've already cut and it's oversized. I have to mill it down to the right size and then also mill that 10 degree angle on there. So it's a rather simple part. I will not show you all the sawing, but all right, let's begin. All right, some initial dimensions here now. This block is one and five eighths by one and five eighths. Well, what's the chances of you having any one and five eighths? I didn't have any. And it's just a little bit longer than that. It is one and seven eighths long. So I started with a piece of cold roll steel that's two inches square. Was out in my garage and it's kind of rusty. And I already cut off a piece a little bit longer than what I need. As I said, it needs to be one and seven eighths. So the first thing I'm going to do since these are rough saw uh, cut, I'm going to square up one end and then I'm going to mark it one and seven eighths long and then I'm going to face it to that length. And that's a good operation for the four jaw chuck and I do not even have to center it very well in the four jaw chuck. But let me square up this rusty end and let's see what we got. All right, it's set up in the four jaw chuck and it's not running very true because it doesn't matter and I'm not going to waste time setting it perfectly for a simple facing operation. Okay, that takes care of one end. Okay, that turned out just fine. This end is faced and squared off and deburred. Now this block needs to be one and seven eighths long. Why? Because all of these holders for the tool bits are one and seven eighths. As you can see here. So while you weren't looking I already put a little die on there and marked it with the height gauge at one and seven eighths. Now this is going to go back into the four jaw chuck and I will face this side down to the line. Now I'm not going to show that because it's exactly what I did here. I wish I didn't have to face that much off but when I saw that off you know you're never sure how straight your saw is going to cut so that's why I allowed a little bit more, but now it has to be removed. I'll see you in a minute. Okay, I'm not going to show you cutting here, but let me talk about getting the correct length here, which should be one and seven eighths. It's probably accurate enough just to go to the layout line, and you can see I'm not very far from the layout line, but if a fellow wants to be a little more accurate, here's some tips for you. You can measure it with your dial or digital calipers and right now the piece is 1.937 and I'm right up against the chuck jaws. You probably could leave it out a little bit and then measure like this. Is that showing up? But I prefer it up against the face of the chuck. Another way is to use your depth gauge here, but of course this only reads in 64ths, so that's only semi-accurate. But do you recall recently when I bought this half depth mic? So this is just perfect for that job, so I already measured that. Again, it's the same as the calipers, and that's 1.937, but doing the math, I want it to be 1.875 long, so there's 62 thousandths that I have to take off. So 
Since I have moved the carriage for the purposes of the demonstration, I'm going to bring it back and let the tool touch the work, or I could even take one more pass and then let me show you. I know this doesn't show, show up very well, but I'm going to lock the carriage over here. And then looking at this side, I like to use my carriage stop, which is up against the carriage right now. So there's several ways of doing this. Remember, I want to take off, what did I say? I got to look again, 62 thousandths, which is a sixteenth of an inch. So I can back this off, 62 thousandths. There's a micrometer dial there. And then that will be the exact length, but maybe take that in two passes. A roughing cut and a finishing pass, so that's very handy. Another way, if you do not have a graduated dial, you just have a, a homemade stop or something, use a 16th inch drill. And using that as a gauge. You could use a gauge block too, but it doesn't need to be that accurate. Lots of different ways of doing that. But that's how I'm coming to the final exact length of the piece. Within a thousandth or two, that's plenty close. Okay, I'm within a couple thousandths of my 1.875. Plenty, plenty close. Don't get carried away now, even though I showed you how to get it pretty close. All right, again, this is two inch stock. I need it to be one and five eighths. Now, you in fact could go ahead and make this with the two inch stock. In fact, later on, I forgot the name, but there is a company that is making reproductions of this. And they have a new model out, and I'll give you a link for that. And they made uh, five sizes of these. They added on one size so that you could do half inch uh, bits. But in order to accommodate that, they had to make this a little bit larger. So that's why I'm saying that you could stick with the two inch if you want. But I'm going to remain true to South Bend. So what I've already done here is marked it. And that's way too much to mill off. So I am going to saw that off. And then I'll meet you over at the milling machine. Then I will mark and saw and mill the other side. But you don't need to see both sides. So... I'll be right back, and when I'm back, it will be sawn off close to the line, and then we'll go to the milling machine. Okay, I've sawn this off. I left a little bit for machining here. The vise is clean. The work will be clamped. Now, notice that I'm hanging it. I'm not putting it in the middle, which some of you are going to complain about. But I'm hanging it out enough here so that I can use a micrometer here to take a measurement, although you could put it in the middle and use a depth micrometer. Remember, there's a hundred ways of doing this. I beg of you to wear your safety glasses when you're working in the shop and write your dimensions down as well. So I'm going to tighten this up real well and I'm going to try using this three fluted carbide uh, bit here because it's, it's pretty wide so if that cuts okay uh, that's what I'll use otherwise I'll switch to a smaller diameter sharp cutter. Okay, I've taken several passes. Let me check it with a micrometer. And it's 1.635, so I have 10 or 11 thousandths to go. And this will be my finishing pass, so I'll... I like to start down at this end. It throws more of the chips away from me. That's why I'm doing that. And I'll raise the table by 10 thousandths. You can't see that. I'm raising the knee crank.
and I'm within a thousandth so I will take it out all right now I will deburr it and then I will mark it again I will go out into the garage saw it off and I'll mill the second side I'm not going to show that but I did want to tell you that after this is burred deburred and then sawn I probably will not have to do any measurement I will just take a reading on the micrometer dial of the knee and raise it to that amount and I should end up with the same dimension that's the way I'm going to do it without using a micrometer just trying to show you different ways all right I just finished the second side and I'm on dimension so out it comes and I'll see you over at the workbench you know when you think about it well I'm halfway through this video in 10 minutes or 15 and all I've done really is brought the uh, the block here to roughed out dimensions well finished dimensions but you know there's that much waste with two inch stock and that took a lot of time but anyway this is what I've got now it looks good and by the way you might have watched a recent video where I did uh, tramming and the proof is in the tasting of the pudding I guess is how it goes because uh, there's very little evidence of it being out of tram that is the evidence here shows that the machine is in tram in terms of uh, with a larger cutter like that the trailing edge will leave an extra ring well or it could be the forward edge depending on the direction of your feeding or your travel anyway so I put a little layout die on that end and now I'm going to lay out the big hole notice it is not really on center so I'll have to find the dimensions and lay that out I'm going to do that with a height gauge always use a height gauge if you can if you have one all right let's do one side at a time in review the stock is one and five eighths so I have the height gauge set for half of that which is 13 sixteenths and yes I know I'm not working on a surface gauge always proof yourself by flipping it over like that so that is a center line in one direction well the next one is not half that is it's not in the center so let me figure that out I'll be right back okay in order to get my center point there I need to turn it around like this and locate the other line the diameter of uh, these pieces, well, right here, it's really an oddball. Every one of them is slightly different, but it, they're approximately 1.350. They probably made these out of different bar stock, different batches, but anyway, it's about 1.350, so half of that. And that comes to about 1 and 11 30 seconds, so it's a really an oddball size. Henry just came down here to visit me. Say hi, Henry. Hi. Wave. <laughs> Let me finish this little clip, Henry, and then we'll play, okay? Anyway, that's about 1 and 11, 30 seconds. You'll never find stock that size, neither will I. Half of that, again, is I got sidetracked here with Henry. Uh, 0.675, so I've got this height gauge set for that. And I will mark it off like that. And that is where this hole will go. And I'm going to do this on the lathe. This could be done on the milling machine with a boring bar, but I'm going to do it on the lathe. And I'm going to center push, punch this, and I'll show you how I'm going to center it when we get into the four jaw chuck work. Okay, the next step is to drill and, well, ream or bore. I don't know if I have a reamer of the right size because this is, in fact, going to be like a 15 16 hole. Now, I've center punched those cross marks that I just made. And notice that I just made a set of copper jaws here also so I don't scuff up the work. But I have roughly located the work using a ball bearing center here. But that's not close enough, or maybe it is. You can do it any way you want. There's a thousand ways of doing this. But I'm going to use my Sterrett 
center tester which I haven't used in a long time some of you may get a kick out of it if you have one or you may enjoy it anyway so let's take a look at that okay here's the general principles of how this works the center finder is held in a lantern type tool post which hardly anyone has anymore and the pointer is in the center punch mark and this amplifies the error. There are no actual measurements or readings. I should say any graduations or readings on this. But the way we do this is, uh, and notice the ratio here. You got about an inch and a half a pointer here and about eight inches over here. Now watch as I turn the machine on and you'll see it wobble. Now this is going to take a while, but the general principle here is that I will adjust the forejaw chuck until there is virtually no movement here. It, and uh, this appears to be on or in line with this center point. So let me go ahead and do that and I'll show it to you after it's pretty well trued up. Okay, it's five minutes later, and that was a pretty easy setup. Again, this point is still in the center punch mark. And take a look now at how it lines up with the center. And I'll turn the machine on. And you can see that it runs almost perfectly true. So it's certainly within a couple thousandths, which is within the tolerance that I have in my mind. Well, now I'm ready to do the drilling and the boring, and I'll do that tomorrow. We'll see you then. Well, I'm back. It's a new day, and let's get started. I've got a center drill mounted in the chuck already, and I like to lay my tooling out. So after center drilling, what I will do is to drill a quarter-inch pilot, and then a half-inch pilot, and then this is a 7 8 bit, then I will go in with a boring bar, and I might take it to the final size with, with this, or I'll get within a few thousands and run a reamer through. But if you've ever used large reamers like this, you know that it's just an awful lot of work to even remove three or four thousandths by hand using a wrench on the square end. So, not sure how I'll do that yet, but uh, let's get started and drill a center hole. Okay, I'm ready for boring, so this is the setup here, this little 5 8 boring bar. And I'm ready to go. Now I have set the stop such that I will not go in too far with my boring bar and strike the back of the chuck. Okay, I took an initial cut, like a scratch cut, and I measured it with a telescoping gauge and the micrometer and I've got about 30 thousandths to go. My final dimension will be 0.932 inches and then I want this just to have a slide fit. So this will be my test plug. Be sure and work up to your dimensions slowly so the test plug is just about ready to go in 
and I measured with the telescoping gauge and I have remember my target is 0.932 and I'm at 0.923 so I got about nine thousandths or so to go or eight I think I'll take off eight thousandths and see what happens here but Okay, I am just about one thousandth too small. You can see that this bushing does not quite go in, but take a look now with this reamer. It does start. Now you know that hand reamer, this is a hand reamer. They are slightly tapered on the last inch approximately, so it does start. But I think rather than struggling with this, I'm going to take one thousandth more off with the boring bar, and that should do it. Yep, she started, but a little too snug for me. I'll take one more pass without increasing the feed at all, and that should clean it up. Well, that should do it. Just, I don't want to have to struggle with it. Alright, that does it. These pieces here just need a little polishing. So, I'm done and I've already deburred using this. So, I'm ready to take it out of the machine. Well, I'm extremely happy with the fit. Now, if you have trouble with the fit, make these pieces fit the hole rather than scrapping this. I always think it's easier to hold a dimension externally like this than internally, especially with a boring bar. Now again, I could have reamed that. Where's my reamer here? This is, what did I say, 15 sixteenths? And still just a little bit of undersize on this reamer, but all of these pieces fit so nicely. And also note that on the top piece here, if we hold a straight edge there, it should be approximately uh, this flat, a little bit below the surface here, because remember there'll be a zero mark on there. Now these two holes I will drill later on. And for now, I'm going to go ahead and lay out and mill this angle. Now, that's 10 degrees. I measured it, and if you remember the direction sheet, anyway, that's 10 degrees, so let me go ahead and lay that out. And then I'll show you how I'm going to mill that. There's a lot of different ways to do it. I have layout die on the work, and the dimension there from the end to the line is one inch. And now, using a protractor set at 10 degrees, now you do not even need to mark that if you're going to use taper gauges, which I am, but I just wanted to show you more than one way to do it. First I'll show you how to do it without a taper gauge, and I've shown you this operation many times, and whatever you do, do not tilt the head on the machine. It is not necessary, but however, I suppose you could do that, but with the work held lightly in the vise, now because of the taper on these jaws, I have to lay a parallel on there, and then a straight edge, a rather thin straight edge, and adjust it such that 
if I can zoom in on that, your ruler is parallel with your layout line. And then we can just mill it down to the layout line. All right, now the other way. If you do not have a set of taper gauges, get yourself a set. And there's an assortment here, and I'm going to use the 10 degree block. This makes it real easy, so we're just using this to raise the work up. Put that about in the center of the vise. Like that. And I'll mill it down to the line, and I've got two lines here, so actually I'll probably watching, be watching the line on the top. Again, I'll use the same three fluted cutter that I did on the other job, and I think I'll feed in this direction. So that's going to work just great. Okay, last pass, it should take it right to the line. Okay, that turned out great. I still have the original mill finish there, which is not good looking on two sides compared to the machine side, but anyway. That's all I can do, and that is the end of part one. I will drill and locate, I should say locate and drill these two holes later on because I want those to align with the groove here and a few other things. So I'll talk about that in part two where I make these. Actually, I'll make one. So be sure and watch that in part two. And then in part three, and this is a repetition. I will actually use this to grind a lathe tool. So how about that? Hope you enjoyed this very, very long part. <laughs> and I'll see you next time. This is Mr. Pete saying so long for now. Be sure and watch all four of these older videos of mine that are related to grinding lathe tool bits. I'll put the links in the descriptions.